Hi, this is Shia Rubinoff. I'm here with Hal Lonis. Hal, please introduce yourself to our audience. Tell them who you are and what you do. Hi, Shira. Thanks for having me. I'm the Senior Vice President and CTO of the Small and Medium Business and Consumer Business Unit at OpenText, which is uh, uh, now the parent company of Webroot and Carbonite. Excellent. That's a mouthful. Yeah, that's a mouthful. Uh, a lot sure of changes. a lot of responsibility as well. Yeah. Well, to that point, a lot of changes. We had a nice conversation last year. Can you talk a little bit about what has changed for you in the organization in the past year? Yeah, quite a bit. So Carbonite uh, completed the acquisition of Webroot early last year in March. Right. And um, we started down a path of working on uh, cyber resilience solutions. And what we mean by that is that we're combining the layers of security with the final safety net of backup and recovery. So when you bring those things together and make it easy for consumers and individuals and small businesses, we think of that as cyber resilience. And it's the ability to kind of absorb threats and and uh, problems, you know, and, and recover quickly, whether you're a business or an individual. Oh, interesting. And personally, with your manifestation within the company, can you talk a little bit about your changes there and what your responsibilities have been since all these changes have happened? Yeah. So I went from being a CTO at Webroot right. to being a senior vice president and CTO for, for Carbonate plus Webroot together. So wow. taking on risk responsibility for the backup products as well as the security products. Well, I think they all kind of meld with each other. So I think that's important that you have one person overseeing all of it. So I'm sure you're the right man for the job. So that's great. Thanks. So let's talk about HTTPS as we have in the past. Can you talk a little bit about the HTTPS challenge and yeah. the challenges you're having or challenges people have or that SMBs have? Yeah. You know, the intent of HTTPS is to provide a secure communication channel between you on the browser right. and between the website. And the problem is that although it's a secure connection and that data is all encrypted, yeah. it really sort of knocks out the visibility for the security gear that's in between you and and the website. Right. And so that security gear is basically now blind to the traffic that's going on. So it, it kind of gives the bad guys a new place to hide within that traffic. Sure. Well, that's an interesting uh, way of defining it. And I think that's uh, it's spot on there. And so how does Wellbrew actually solve for the challenge? Because, you know, there's many challenges that come from that. What do you guys do to solve that? So we bring to bear our Bright, Cl our Bright Cloud Threat Intelligence solution. So that's a Webroot yeah. product, Bright Cloud Threat Intelligence. And yeah. it has URL classification, file classification, internet protocol, IP classification. And within that, you know, we've got 10 years of experience. We have some of the most sophisticated uh, cloud-based machine learning analysis, mm -hmm. you know, available anywhere. We've been at it for a long time in an operational sense. And now we have a new facility within BrightCloud, a new product called uh, domain scoring. Okay. And the domain score is a way that we can assess what's going on kind of at the domain level yep. uh, and provide a, an answer for HTTPS traffic. And how important is that score? It's super important because since the bad guys can hide uh, malicious content within a benign site, mm -hmm. in fact, we find 25% of malware sites are actually on a top-level benign site. So having an understanding of what's going on beneath the domain level sure. and a score for that gives yep. uh, organizations a way to uh, set policy and uh, give security on that top-level site. And accuracy of that score is, I'm sure, spot on. It's absolutely critical that we get it right. So, you know, if we cast a site as a false positive, we've, if we make a mistake, it's going to affect business processes. Conversely, if we miss a site, if we say, oh, it's okay, and there's yeah. malware hiding there, then users get infected and it causes lots of problems that way. So we've got to be accurate. And you guys have recently released a threat report. Is uh, all this included in the threat report? What other things can you talk about that are within the threat report? And one more point to that, how does your threat report differ a little bit than others that have been released as well, specifically to Webroot? Yeah, so let me talk about that first. Please. So I think our threat report is different because we have uh, so much experience, so many operational products out there, and so yeah. much visibility into the internet. So you know, with uh, 70 million endpoints out there, uh, we see a ton of internet traffic. One of the interesting things that we see now, specifically related to HTTPS, is that users are spending 90% of their time on HTTPS sites, and that's gone up year after year after year. So, you know, they're spending more time on these HTTPS sites, and yet when you think about the invisibility of those to traditional security gear, yeah. it's kind of a frightening situation we're in. So, and, and there's there's um, just lots of information in the um, th annual threat report that I think is worth looking at. Another one mm -hmm. is that we've seen phishing attacks yes. increase by 640% wow. just year over year. So a six-fold increase in, in phishing attacks. So the bad guys are successful. 
They're doing human engineering on us. Uh, you, you know, they're moving from sort of machine-based infections to h- how do I trick users into giving up their usernames and passwords? Well, that it's all, a scary situation. Sure, that also could lean itself towards the whole ransomware attacks, when instead of really targeting the organization themselves, they target individuals within the organization, making it personal, dealing back to the human factors of it. And I talked a little bit before uh, with Eric, we talked about how you're able to trick somebody, almost like a phishing attack or a spear phishing attack, but more insular and in dealing with the human. And when you're dealing with human nature, people are, it's, it's something personal. They have to deal with it quickly. We're not stopping to pause and think. So what would you talk to that point and how you would be able to curtail those issues going on? Because they're coming, they're coming hard and fast. Yeah, that's so true. And spear phishing, you know, we're seeing that more and more where, you know, you and I get a targeted attack from yeah. maybe our boss, yeah. what appears to be our boss. It's sure. a very, uh, you know, um, urgent request for help maybe even over the weekend help now yeah transfer the uh transfer this money my, my plane's taking off take care of this quickly yeah you're the person i trust you have the passwords get it done by the time i land i want to know it's taken care of correct that's right it's... and or you know i forgot my password can i possibly use your username and password to access the system could you log me in can you log me in perfect yeah that's yeah. right and so we see these requests coming they're spear phishing we give up our credentials and then you know the bad guys in you know the way we can stop that actually even if you know uh you know that attacks coming in for one thing we can train the individuals so we yes. can say you know security awareness training and and recurrent training at a frequent basis you know sure. having that um kind of top of mind um sure awareness of what's going on. Secondly is even if you're tricked into clicking on the bad link, um, you know, we have a real-time anti-phishing component that's in our endpoint security. So we actually see that request come in for a username and password and we could stop it there. That's right. And that's a big differentiator as well. It's it's not just the training. Well, one of the big things I do talk about is cyber hygiene within the organization. And the four things are continuous training within the organization, global awareness, uh, security and patching, and zero trust. But um, when you target it and you're able to stop that, and even if you have the training, things do get through. So you're able to stop that, and that's a big deal. That's right. You know, yeah. we, we've always talked about security and layers, right? Yeah. Everywhere from the human element, yeah. training people up front, you know, to what goes on in the network. Sure. And then at the very end, you know, I think, you know, getting back to cyber resilience, even if an attack lands on your endpoint, you know, we can stop it there. But, you know, even at the end of the day, if everything misses, having that backup ready to go and able to restore your business quickly and get you back up and running is just critical. Well, we also talk about having a backup and then you're completely cyber resilient to ransomware. Oh, we, we, we have backups and we're off premise. And I spoke a little bit about that previously in our last podcast, but I'd like to hear your perspective on that. Why isn't a backup that's stored off premise enough for organizations uh, to use and say, you know what, we don't care if we get a ransomware attack, we can be up and running immediately? Why isn't it enough? Yes. Yeah. So you actually want to attack it at every layer, right? I mean, if you can avoid the attack up front, great, you should do that. And so I think, you know, stopping it at every layer, train the user, stop it at the network layer, stop it at the endpoint layer. Yeah, if you have to get your backup back and get it up and running from there, okay. But we want to stop it as soon as possible and at every possible sort of junction. I think that's a very critical piece you said, being proactive as well as reactive. We see a lot of companies playing catch up. Okay, don't worry, we'll protect you if this happens. If this happens, this is what you do. And you're saying, don't worry, we'll protect you if it happens. But here, we're going to also be proactive around it not happening too. You have to have both layers together in order to be properly secure. Yeah, that's so important. And I think, you know, know, if you're a company and to be a little bit cynical, you know, if you only have one tool, then you're going to emphasize that, you know, just that one thing. Correct. And, And, you know, for us, having this spectrum of capability, you know, we really want to emphasize all the layers and all the capability and say, employ all these things to protect yourself. It's, it's all equally important. Very important. Yeah. And I want to touch back on one thing you mentioned, which was the domain safety score. Can you talk a little bit about the specifics of it? Just explain it more to our audience so they really understand how this works and why it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. We actually assess thousands of factors, Mm -hmm. you know, going back in 10 years of history, we look at, um, you know, incredible amounts of data, and we say, you know, crunching all that together, um, we come up with a score of between of from one to a hundred, indicating okay. how safe or how risky it is to go visit that site. Yeah. And remember, what we're doing also is looking at all the content that's underneath the top level, so that even if you only have to assess based on the initial connection at that top level, yeah, you really have a sense of what might be lurking, sort of beneath Hello. the waterline, if you will. So you know, if a if a score is one. 
a- absolutely you wouldn't want to go there ever, right? You wouldn't want to touch that domain. If it's 100, you, you can be pretty sure it's a very safe domain and we've never seen any problem with it. And you can be, you know, uh, you know, very confident in visiting that site. Sure. Scores in between, you yeah. know, we leave it up to organizations. The gray area. Yeah. yeah. And you can kind of set your own th- uh, risk or threshold level of yeah. what, you know, you're willing to um, take. But, you know, we take 70 as a pretty good sort of watershed level mm-hmm. of, you know, if it's above 70, probably pretty safe. If it's below 70, I wouldn't go there. Understood. Well, thank you so much for your time. And this is a wealth of information and love to hear that all the things that you've been doing in the last year. I look forward to hearing a lot more from Webroot. Thank you, Shira. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Pleasure as always. 